You're listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hi, I'm Chris Connor. I'm a film and television producer. Uh, had the opportunity to work on films, on television series, uh, political campaigns, and in advertising. And right now, I'm actually uh, working on an animated project with some uh, people in Nashville. Chris Connor, welcome to the Make It Podcast. How are you? I'm really great. I'm much better now that I'm having this conversation with you. You are an absolutely uh, incredible person to have on for this audience in particular because you are an indie film legend. You've been <laughs> around <laughs> for 20 years uh, in the research for building up to this conversation. Chris, I talked with just a variety of people, and some of these people say that you're responsible for their career and, and that you've mentored them along the way. And so to have you on here, uh, is, is meaningful. I think obviously to me, but, but to those listening that have come across your, your work and, and have met you for them for sure. But then hopefully also for this worldwide audience too, that's going to learn so much about the, the real grit it takes to stay in this business. Um, I'd like to start with your legendary, Instagram profile pic. So speaking of legendary, so you, you have this profile pic, which was yeah. your first pick in 2012, you put on Instagram and you have never changed it. <laughs> and, and it's, it looks like it's like a, like an artifact, like a golden head, almost like you would see something out of Indiana Jones. So tell me, what is that a picture of? And why has that been your profile pick for all these years? Well, you know, you're right on the money. It is actually a copy of the Hovito Seidel from Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is exactly what it is. And it sits on a shelf in my office. Um, a friend of mine, was I was lucky enough to get it from them. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I don't know, ex I'm not certain on this, but I think it was taken from the mold of the original, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I mean, it's really close if it wasn't. Um, it's made out of a resin, but it's, it's painted to look gold. Um, so that's really just a picture of it sitting on, on the shelf. Um, and you know, I've never changed it just because I don't, I don't know. I don't really know. Honestly, I don't have a good reason. I mean, I think I, I don't really use social media the same way that a lot of people do, to be honest. Um, I've never been one for taking a lot of pictures of myself or sort of that part of it or, or using it to advertise, you know, my work or myself really that way. In fact, you'll see pictures maybe from shoots and things, but, but the truth is I don't do that kind of self-promotion. It's funny. I mean, I've worked in a lot of, I've done a lot of advertising and worked on political campaigns to, you know, try to make people look great and get their message out there. And, and yet I, it, I just don't really want to do that for myself. I just never have. In some ways, I think that some, when some people do it too much, it sort of dips into a, a kind of vanity that I'm not, not really interested in, but, and I'm not, I'm not being trying to be judgmental. I'm just saying, I just have never used it for that. And so I've just never changed it. You know, I just use it to share little moments that come up and, you know, every now and again to talk about something specific or, you know, but really rarely to promote anything. Yeah. Facebook took off probably around 2006. I had started mm -hmm. using it around four and five, but it was only on campuses then. And I was literally using Facebook to catch up on assignments I had missed when I couldn't make it to class or something like that. And obviously Instagram came after that and, and Twitter around 2010-ish, uh, maybe 11-ish before it took off. So you've been doing film before that was like a thing. Yeah. And it does feel like you have made a concerted effort to to remain private. I mean, even on your profile page outside of or profile pages on the on the web outside of 
social, you know, you leave your picture blank there. Um, when did you decide, was there a moment that you decided that, that you're going to make sort of, you know, a concerted effort to, to have sort of an persona of anonymity? I, I don't know if there's a moment, but I've just always been a really private person to be honest with you, you know? Um, and I, and I mean, I work with people that I'm friends with and I've had a, you know, an opportunity to do that throughout my whole career. But, um, I kind of like to keep some of those things separate, my personal life and, and that, and, and honestly, <laughs> I, cause I think it would be boring to most people. I mean, I don't share those things cause I just don't think that everyone needs to hear what I think all the time or, um, so, you know, and I, I had, well, you know, I had my space first and I did post pictures of myself there and I did post more pictures of work and talk about work back in those days. And that was early on, right. When I was getting started and then I got a Facebook account and I just didn't really do it there. I didn't promote things. I didn't use it for that. And then I got rid of Facebook, uh, because I just didn't like, you know, I, I guess I just started seeing a lot of toxic stuff on there and I wasn't really interested in that. I liked staying in touch with friends and that's actually what I like about Instagram is because it's sort of a condensed version of that. You know, you, you get quick little moments and quick little stories and, and I like that better. So that's, I guess why I use it that way. But yeah, I just, I, yeah, I just prefer to, to do it that way. I've just never been one to sort of put myself out there like that. And not for any negative reason, just because like I said, I'm just private and, and I quite frankly never figured anyone would really <laughs> care. There's enough interesting stuff and amusing stuff to watch out there. I don't feel like what I would be putting out there would be adding to that really. But Chris, we, we deeply care. <laughs> 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 we care. If you, if you put it out there, we'll eat it up now, but here's the thing. I almost think that maybe it's too late now because now it's, it's, you've had this unintended consequence, right? Yeah, that sure. It, it almost reminds me of the old Cobra effect story. Uh, do, do you know this story? I don't. Uh, so basically how, how it went was, you know, India, India used to be uh, a commonwealth of, of the UK and they had this Cobra problem. There were like too many Cobras. And so uh, a decree from the crown said, you know, we'll pay X amount of pounds for anyone that shows us a head of a cobra, you know, killed. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with the intent to solve the cobra problem, what happened was folks in India started breeding cobras. (laughs) (laughs) So they could be paid. Uh, and so they were all getting rich and then, so the crown cut off the payments. And then once they cut off the payments, the folks that were breeding the cobras just let their cobras out of the cages. And so they had a problem that was 10 times the one they had when they started the program. So That's it's interesting. I've heard that. Yeah. Everywhere. And so what you've done is, is you've taken, you've, you've been making this great art on one hand and then on the other hand, not showing us sort of how that took place and, and sort of playing the whole social media game, which I love. And in turn, uh, you've become a man of mystery and that's become unintentionally because it sounds like you, you just weren't into it. Yeah. But the, now your brand is that of like a mysterious producer that uh, is, is the man <laughs> behind the curtain, so to speak. It wasn't intentional, but if that's what's happened, then so be it. I mean, I'm, I like it better that way. So, you know, um, I think that I've always gravitated towards, towards things that, you know, didn't, didn't advertise a lot that didn't, they just sort of like, this is what I'm going to do. And if you're into it, great. And if you're not into it, that's great too. You know, it's not a, it's not arrogant. It's not anything. It's just, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do the best that I can. And if, you know, if that, if that benefits you, that's great. If it doesn't, then I understand too. And, you know, so I, I don't know. I've just always, I've enjoyed artists more that were like that, I think. And maybe that's what it just, you know, rubbed off on me that way. I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm definitely more comfortable in that, in that way. I like, I like it more, I guess clearly, or, you know, you wouldn't be saying that. So <laughs> you've mentioned working on a political campaign a few times and then mm-hmm. you deleted your Facebook. Um, was there a moment you could think of? I want to dig into that a little bit, just based on the current zeitgeist and what old Zucks is up to every day. But mm-hmm. I also, I uh, deleted my Facebook. I only use it for bonsai work. I don't have one personally. I, 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 they make you have one as a business, but I only use it to check and see who tagged me in a picture. Uh, what moment was it for you or situation that, that you alluded to that 
said, you know what? This isn't going the right direction. I'm going to delete my Facebook account. Probably watching people that I mutually respect, two different, three different, four different, whatever people that I mutually respect, you know, dig into each other about something, no matter what it was, whatever, you know, social issue, political issue, whatever it was. And and I think to myself, you know what? I know both of you and I know that you're both good people and I don't understand why you're saying these things to each other in this environment, maybe because of the anonymity that social media kind of offers in a way. I mean, you're out there and it's your face and your name and everything, but when you're sitting behind the keyboard, I think you talk to people, you know, in a way that you wouldn't if you were in the same room. And I just thought like, I don't, and, and the couple of times I engaged in it early on, I didn't, I didn't like it. You know, I wrote something, typed something. And then I thought, you know what, that's really not me. I don't, I don't like that. Mm-hmm. I don't like the way that that came out. I don't like, I don't like this interaction at all. You know, I, I won't, I won't avoid, I mean, you know, if I don't like conflict, I don't seek it out. I'm not scared of it, but I'm also not going to seek it out. And so, you know, if I can walk away from something, I'll walk away from something, you know, before I engage, I, I also will not get run over. I will not be a doormat either, but you know, I will, I will walk away. So I think it was that kind of thing. It was just watching good people angry and maybe rightfully so in a lot of ways on both sides, angry about things, but knowing that there are good people out there that are just tearing each other apart over something that, you know, I don't think they're changing. I don't think they're changing each other's minds. I don't think they're really listening to each other. So I think it was that, you know, I think it was that probably. Yeah. And we saw a lot of that in 2019 and 2020, I would say like probably on hyperdrive compared to what it used to be. And I wonder, I want to come back to that. I want to call back to that because I want to ask you down the line a little bit, sort of what the indie filmmakers role is in, in sort of closing that chasm that we have between each other without being derivative of, of what's already been out there or already been said. But before we get to that, I'd love to know uh, you are from East Tennessee and Mm -hmm. I'm curious, was there a moment that you can remember that sticks out to you well, when you knew you wanted to be in film and, and wanted to do it for life? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm originally from Sevier County, Tennessee, Gatlinburg, uh, and my family's been in that area for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up growing up mostly in Florida. Uh, my parents got divorced. We moved my mom and uh, uh, my stepdad, we moved to um, who raised me. My stepdad is my dad. I mean, I say that only it's a technical term. He's my father, but, uh, we moved to Florida and then we moved back to Tennessee when I was in high school, we actually moved to middle Tennessee, not to Nashville, but to middle Tennessee. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was a kid, you know, in Florida and I loved the movies and I would go every chance I, I got. And when my parents would ask me what I wanted for getting good grades or for doing well in something, it was always take me to this movie, take me to this movie. Um, I remember specifically too, it was, I started at, I wanted to go to movies that, you know, were R rated things that I probably sh- you know, shouldn't have been going to, but it, you know, they, a lot of times they would say, okay, you know, depends on what's in it, but you know, tell us what it's about, tell us what's in it and we'll, we'll decide. And, you know, and I remember them taking me to see Terminator and, you know, the thing and a lot of those kinds of th- movies when I was young, cause I got an A or I got whatever I was, you know, did whatever I was supposed to do. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I remember um, going back. It's interesting. You mentioned the Raiders of the Lost Ark thing. Yeah. I was blown away by that movie as a kid, you know, sitting in the theater, just completely you know. blown away by it. And, uh, and I thought to myself, someone gets to do that for a living, you know, that and that they, um, they shot Cocoon, the movie Cocoon, uh, where I lived, near mm-hmm. where I lived in Florida. Where Florida is that? It's in the sort of Largo, it's in the Tampa Bay area, sort of Largo, Clearwater. I lived, uh, I lived near Indian Rocks Beach in Largo when I was a kid. And, okay. uh, and they filmed, we happened to be out one day and we saw them filming Cocoon. And I got to, you know, watch for a little bit. Not, I didn't get right up on set, but, you know, it was just fascinating to me. So, it was, so I was sort of blown away by these movies I was watching And then I realized like, oh, someone does this for a living. They get paid to do this. They get paid to tell these stories and to, and they get to do this. And and so I was pretty much hooked on it from there. And then pretty typical, I asked for a camera, you know, early on. And and I was, my parents were, I was lucky enough that my parents got me a camera and video camera. um, And, you know, I just started taking photos and video stuff and, and then did it a little bit more in high school. And then, 
pretty much in high school, I knew that this is exactly what I wanted to do. And, um, and at first when I went to school, I went to a school that I went to UT first and it didn't really have a, at that time, a proper film school. It had a mass comm department, but, and so then I decided to go to, um, I moved to Atlanta and started going to film school at Georgia state university. And I really liked it. It was great. Actually, I had a really great time in Atlanta. And then I saw an ad in premier magazine, um, for Watkins College of Art. And mm-hmm. I decided, you know, I can, I could save an enormous amount of money by just moving to Nashville, which I already liked. Cause I had, like I said, I'd gone to high school in middle Tennessee and I liked Nashville. I didn't know anyone here, but I liked it. And, uh, but I knew I could save an enormous amount of money. And even then in school, I knew that school was not going to give me a job. It was not going to, you know, it was really just to lay the groundwork. And I knew I, that I was going to have to hustle to get my own job and all that. So where the degree came from really wasn't as important to me. Uh, so I moved here sight unseen. I took my last exam in Atlanta and I hooked my car up to the back of U-Haul and drove up here and I knew two people. Uh, one of my friends was going to Vanderbilt to law school and another friend was uh, had just moved here that I had been, a, it was one of my old roommates from UT that had moved here to, to get his first job. And mm-hmm. I moved in with him and uh, and then, yeah, and I stayed and I loved it. And at first, honestly, I thought that I, I really wanted to go to Los Angeles. And when I was in Watkins, I had a teacher who, uh, Deneen Rowan, who was a really great teacher and, and, uh, mentored me a, a quite a lot. And she, she had an a internship opportunity in Los Angeles. And then I had another professor at Watkins who had a production company and he offered me one locally so I started working for him while I was still in school and at first not getting paid, but then starting to get paid here and there. And then, and so it was either take the internship that she could get me in LA and move to LA or stay here. And I thought, you know, I'll stay for a couple of years. I'll stay for a couple of years and then I'll go to LA. And then I never left because I love it here. And, and I sort of fell in love with Nashville and it's been incredibly good to me. So, you know, I had no reason to leave. And not too long after that, I kind of decided cause I had some really good advice from some mentors that, you know, taught me a lot that I just was like, you know what, I'm going to be as successful as I'm going to be right here. And I'm fine with that. I want, I want to live here. I, you know, I want to work here. So that's what I'm going to do. And if it means that I don't ever make, you know, a giant movie, then that's what it means. But I was okay with that. Uh, and it, and that choice has been, has, has definitely been the right choice. Uh, because I've been happy these 20 years doing it and not always, but you know, for the most part, and I'm lucky for that. I mean, I'm lucky that I made that choice and had good advice and I'm glad to hear that other people have told you that maybe I gave them some good advice along the way. Cause I certainly hope I have, cause I got it from other people. And if I could pass that along, that would be a great thing. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the value of that mentorship because when you're young, how can you make such a life affirming decision? Right. Especially when all the examples of the career you want happen somewhere else, they happen in LA. And and so the, the big decision while you're, while you're so young and impressionable to say, well, I'm just going to stay here because I know that the, the ultimate win is happiness uh, is huge. Like it's, like oh, I, I'm even wondering how you even could do that, but I, I'm sure it came with a lot of uh, mentorship, which we're going to get into here in a second. But you, there's a lot to dig into because we started with Cocoon, and <laughs> and I'm a guy who loved Steve Gutenberg and thought to myself, Tom Hanks simply did Steve Gutenberg better than Steve Gutenberg. And therefore, Steve Gutenberg <laughs> sort of faded away. I don't know what he. What are your thoughts about that? I, you know, I think he's. Yeah, I mean, when I was growing up, he was in you know several really good movies, and and he was great in that movie. He really was great in that movie. I mean, you know, I, um, and I've always thought he was talented. You know, there's some performers I think that get pigeonholed a little bit, and, and maybe he did. I, I don't know. I don't know that he would say that, but. Um, I've always, I've always liked him, you know, but that movie was, was great. Cocoon was great. I mean, it had a, a lot of really good, uh, actors in it and it was just really well done. Um, and it, and it was, you know, a big movie to me when I was a kid, I really liked it. Yeah. Then the police Academy films. Now, if you want to see some really rare Steve Gutenberg, mm-hmm. there's a movie that came out, I want to say in 82, 
Maybe I have the date wrong, and if I am, don't kill me. It's, you know, whatever. The movie is called Kentucky Fraud Movie. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen this before? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he's got, it's like a movie with a bunch of little vignettes, and he has one of the vignettes in there, and it's hilarious. Uh, so does Arsenio Hall, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. Early Arsenio, before anyone knew who Arsenio was, he has one of the funniest scenes in any movie I've ever seen. So go out, watch Kentucky Fried Movie, and uh, <laughs> laugh your head off. It is a, it's a parody movie. But I want to touch back on the mentor piece because it's one sure. of the things that um, if you value it, you don't know how to get there. So, uh, and if you don't value it, uh, you know, you find out that you should have. So in your opinion, having been sort of a mentor to so many people in independent film, what do you think is the best way to find a mentor? I think to get, just get out and, and try to get for film and television. I think it's about getting on as many sets as you can, as fast as you can mm-hmm. and meet people and work hard and, you know, be an asset to, to, to the production, then people will seek you out. You know, if you, uh, I, I remember the internship I got from the professor at Watkins, he said, Hey, I'm shooting a commercial for the YMCA this weekend. And any of you are welcome to come and participate. Uh, you, you know, you'll be a, a production assistant. You won't get paid, but you're welcome to come out and it'll sort of be, you know, on the job training as it were. And I was the only one that went, I couldn't believe wow. it. I was the only one that showed up. I couldn't believe it. I was like, why are, why are we all here? You know, if you're not gonna, um, but I showed up, he asked me again, I showed up, he asked me again. And then he asked me if I wanted to, you know, a permanent internship. I said, yes, they, you know, two or three more jobs. And he said, I'm going to start paying you. You work hard and you show up and you're on time and all that stuff. And that's what happened, you know? And I started working for him and he get, you know, he gave me, his name is Ben Ryan. He gave me, you know, my first job and I'll always be indebted to him for that, you know? Uh, and I learned some things too about owning your own business from him and that I watched him have his own production company and, you know, have successes and struggle at moments and like anyone does. And, and so I learned a lot from watching him and, and he was good to me that way. He threw me in, you know, he really did. He was like, okay, here you go. You know, you say you want to do this. Well, here you go. And he let me start coordinating jobs and, you know, ultimately producing jobs later on. And, um, and so it was a good experience that way, but I had a couple of different people like that, that I worked hard for them. And I think they liked having me around and, uh, and, and that's how it happened. You know, I think, you know, being an asset to someone's production. And I think people that want to help other people along, once they see you working hard and that you're actually serious about it, they're going to, they're going to want to help you. It reminds me of, I wish I could remember the person that gave me the advice, but it was, it was uh, sort of in between high school and college for me when I got this advice. So, you know, in between that time for me, Chris, I was trying to have a singing group and, uh, name the group's name was solace. And I was trying to, to make it in music and do all this stuff. Right. And I was told 80% of success is just showing up. Like if you, if you just show up to the thing that you're supposed to show up to, you already, you already sort of beat the, the drick. You already sort of beat the, the, the long tail a little bit. Like it's like, people, people will literally not show up to their dream. <laughs> and you can, yeah, and so if there's true. 10 people that want something, you can beat seven of them just by being there and being on time, like you said. And, uh, it reminds me of, um, going to all these showcases around, uh, the country and we would go to these showcases and it was so fascinating looking at it, looking back on it, reminiscing Chris, because there would be hundreds I mean, hundreds of groups that would show up for these showcases where the winner gets money or gets a record deal or whatever. But at the end, it would always be the same five to eight groups every time, every time. And so it, it's, it was, you started to become friends with all these regional singing groups because it's like, Oh, you made it again. Okay, good. And so it was, it, uh, the cream sort of rises to the top. And I think that that one's actions you, you find out are really the best, the best, uh, predictor of, of, you know, one's success, if you will. Uh, you, you have been a producer 
extraordinaire for a while. <laughs> You've worked with uh, a wide range of talent, both in front of the camera and, and behind the camera. And I'm curious, what is the most challenging actor uh, you've had to work with? Or, or maybe if you don't want to name names, which is fine, could you tell me a story about a time where it was really challenging on set and, and how you overcame it? Hmm. That's an interesting one. Okay. Um, I worked on a movie here years ago. I was in the AD department. I was the second second. So I was running base camp. Right. And the three of the actors on it were really accomplished, very, very good. And, uh, they were, it was, a, it was a movie where it was split. So the first part of the movie was a, was a, in the 1940s was a, the period piece. And then the second half was modern. So the actor that was in the first half, um, she was, you know, she was difficult. Uh, the first week she was great. She was actually lovely. It was a right. good experience. And then for whatever reason, and, and I don't really think there was a particular catalyst, but she, she just became angry, you know, and, uh, and I got the brunt of it because I was the one going to her trailer and, and, you know, trying to get her to set and figuring it out. And I mean, it was like, it was notorious. I mean, people were, other crew members were coming up to myself and the other ADs um, and just saying, we're so sorry, you know, that you're getting treated this way. You guys don't deserve this. And, and we didn't, but, and then when the next two of, of the lead, the main actors came, uh, she was gone. And these other two people came, one of them was, well, the, the two that came were um, Olympia Dukakis and Diane Ladd, and they were incredible. I had such a great relationship with them, and they were so talented and so easy to work with and and so nice to us. And I remember Olympia saying, you know, uh, I heard these stories about the last couple of weeks. What, what, you know, what was she thinking? What was going on? I said, you know, I don't know. But we just, I just, I, you know, my job was to <laughs> was to take care of her and get her to set and run base camp. And that's all I did. You know, when she would yell at me, I would listen to what she said, but I shut off fundamentally because in the end, I think she thought she could run the movie better than the, everyone there. And, and that happens. Yeah. Um, and she was angry for, I assumed other reasons. So I wasn't going to try to, you know, delve into those things or to fight back. I just simply said, you know, yes, ma'am. Okay. You know, I'll try, I'll go make it happen or I'll do this or I'll go tell them that or whatever it was. And, uh, so it was tough, you know, cause I liked her. I, you know, I, she had just done a movie that I loved and I thought she was incredible in it. And she comes from a very famous acting family. So I, it was one of those things where I thought, Oh, I can't wait to work with her. And then she, you know, yelled at me a lot. <laughs> um, but having Olympia and Diane come in after that and be so nice to us and be so professional and, and it was, you know, it just, it made, it made up for it certainly. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was one of those things. Uh, and I don't want to say her name. I'm not trying, I don't want to be negative, even though she was really mean to us for, <laughs> for a couple of weeks, but, um, but yeah, that was one of the most, that was one of the most challenging for sure. It um, sounds like, uh, you killed her with kindness. Yeah. Oh, that's all I could do. I mean, it wasn't my, you know, first of all, I didn't want to get fired. So I wasn't going to, you know, there were moments where I wanted to, you know, say what I thought, but that wasn't my job. And I certainly wasn't going to, you know, put the first AD in a position in that kind of position either. I wasn't going to, you know, speak out of turn. And, and, uh, the first AD was Susan McGuire, who has also been awesome to me and hired me several times and, and been a mentor to me. And I think she's fantastic. And, you know, so I didn't want Susan or Chris Stringfield, the other AD to, you know, catch the brunt of that either. I didn't want her to storm to set mad from base camp and then, you know, uh, take it out on them. She was already taking it out on us enough. So I was trying to, you know, keep her calm, make sure she had the things that she did want, you know, try to soothe her in a way that, you know, would calm her down enough to maybe where she wouldn't yell for a minute and then move on. But like I said, I think she was upset about something that had nothing to do with our movie. And there, yeah. and, you know, you, there's nothing that you can do about that. And when you work with a bunch of different people, that's going to happen. You're going to get someone that's having a bad moment in their life and maybe on 50 other movies would be lovely to you. But on this one, you know, and maybe she was maybe on all the other things that she ever did. She was, you know, great to people and nice to people and kind to people. But in this particular moment, you know, she was upset and angry and it and it showed, you know, Chris, I don't think so. I think I think she probably was like that on set. It, it maybe. Yeah, for sure. Some people are just, you know, <laughs> I have this thought that like people that yell are people that yell and 
you, you don't just learn how to yell one day on set because uh, you're having a bad day or a bad week off set or, or someone's triggered you on set. You don't just learn to do that. And it's something that, that you're sort of programmed to do and it makes you feel powerful. Yelling is about power. And, and usually when you have power, you yell. Uh, I never understood it. And I'm not like, uh, like some new gen softy or anything like that. I, I, I never understood, for example, uh, a coach that yelled. See, the <laughs> coaches like will preach to you. I want you to play with composure and then they'll be the least composed person in the entire organization. Uh, and, 100% you know, true. and what you said about what you said about shutting off when she started yelling so that you could sort of decompress yourself and then respond with yes, ma'am. I find that to be true with children, parents that yell at their kids, their kids aren't listening. They've stopped listening. You can't listen to someone yelling. Uh, it's not something human beings are, are programmed to do. Um, the, if you, the, if you, you can get if, a human to respond out of fear, but not to really hear you listen, you know, yeah. if you raise ahead. your voice to someone, you've lost control. And quite frankly, in my opinion, that means you're not really that good at what you do or, you know, you're having a moment again in your life. It may be things that are unrelated to the work itself, but that you're just not able to, to, to keep control. And, and I agree with you. I have always tried to keep calm at work. And, and if I've yelled at someone, I've regretted it because I just don't, you know, I don't want to do that. I would rather, you know, if, if, if you treat people well, they're going to do so much more work for you. They're going to be so much more into the work. They're going to, you know, care about what you're doing, you know, and, uh, I've always tried to do, that. I've always tried to treat everyone's job. Like it's like, it's my personal job and, uh, and my money and, you know, my idea and my film. And I do that because, you know, then the best work's going to come out. And sometimes people will be mean to you and grind that out of you, but I've always tried to do that, but you're, I, 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 I agree with you 100%. If you scream and yell at people, you will never get the best out of them. And most often it is to make up for something else, you know? So keeping your calm, uh, in any situation in life is really better, but you know, certainly at work and just belittling people at work is not powerful. It's not good. It's not impressive. It's not anything. And I've worked with screamers. I mean, believe me, I've worked <laughs> with people that scream and yell and get in your face. And I've had some really rotten things said to me, but I just lose respect for them at that moment. I, I honestly see them as a child in a way, you know, so they're, I'm, you know, I'm 25 years old, but, you know, on set being an AD and, uh, or a PA and, you know, this 65 year old director that's supposed to be incredible and seasoned is screaming at me. And I just think to myself, you're, you know, I don't know what happened along the way that made you this way. And I feel sorry for you that it did, but, uh, you're angry, but you're not really angry at me. You're just taking it out on me. And, and sometimes you just have to get past that. But yeah, our business draws in really intense personalities. It and certainly, uh, it certainly does. That's, yeah, that's so you're, true. It, that's going to happen. You just have to learn how to, to deal with it. Yeah. I think being in this business has taught me what I, what I just said, which is that no, it didn't happen last week or like something happened on set today. That's not the real cause. Whatever the real cause is happened way, way, way back uh, when you were wearing diapers or a little bit older than that. And, uh, you know, it's just unaddressed, you know, like, yeah, that's that's part of it. But you do have this reputation. I mean, some people are kind of in the middle. I probably am in the middle between uh, screaming at somebody and, and being super chill and calm in the storm kind of guy. And then you are a true calm in the storm kind of guy by reputation. And you had to be uh, in, in one situation for sure. So I'd love if you would talk about and tell us, tell this audience the story of uh, the time you robbed a Wits barbecue. <laughs> wow. Good job. That's good research. I'm impressed by that. Um, okay. So we were in film school and everybody's short films were, uh, you know, like Pulp Fiction, there was a lot of violence and stuff. And listen, I like some violent movies and things like that, but I'm not knocking Pulp Fiction even, but you know, it was just a lot of that kind of stuff was coming out. So I decided to make something that was that way, but making fun of it a little bit. So the concept was two guys rob a Wits barbecue at Christmas, or they rob a fast food place and ended up being a Wits because I had a friend uh, named Napoleon, whose brother ran a Wits barbecue so we could get it on a Sunday, uh, you know, for nothing for free. Right. And so I got some friends from film school and, and we, and it was, it wasn't, it was a, sort of a short, but really it was a scene study for a class is what it really was. 
And um, so we went to the Wits and we set everything up and uh, Tom Bailey and James Brown were the two two guys playing the, the, the burglars or the robbers or whatever. And they did their bit. They came in, they pulled guns on everybody, everybody froze. So we shot that scene <laughs> and we were taking a break and we were all sitting in the front. And this is the Wits barbecue that sits on Nolansville Road. And so it sits on a, it sits on a corner. There's a side street right there near the zoo. And, and I want to just jump in here to, to let the audience give them some context. So <laughs> Nolensville Road is in a part of town in Nashville called Woodbine. And it, is, that the, is that the right one? Chris, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And Woodbine is, is, uh, is a rough neighborhood. All right, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> um, so we shot the scene and, um, my f- Nick, the guy that managed the place, Napoleon's brother and I were standing there and a car pulled through the parking lot. The parking lot was empty, incredibly fast, almost as if it had careened off Nolensville road. And we thought, oh, no, that's weird. So we walked outside. And as soon as we walked, I took about a step and a half out the door. And the Nashville SWAT team closed in on us really quickly. And the guy put a shotgun in my face instantly. And he said, get on the ground, get on the ground. You know, so we obviously got on the ground. And then I looked around and there were police everywhere. But they were so quiet that they, you know, we didn't hear them. We just saw the one car pull through really quickly. And, you know, I was panicked. I mean, I was, it was honestly one of the worst moments of my life because I could not see everybody else behind me. Uh, All I could see were police officers and they all had their guns out and I was waiting for a gun to go off. And it was, it was frightening. I mean, it was, it was awful and it felt like it lasted forever. It probably lasted for 30 seconds, but it felt like it lasted forever. And then it's, then they, over a loudspeaker, they said, come out with your hands up, you know, and Tom, uh, being also cool under pressure told James, he said, listen, uh, you know, put the gun on the counter. They were fake guns. Of course they were not real guns, but they said, he said, put the gun on the counter. And so they all slow, everybody slowly walked out. And then they, and then only then they, the police officers saw the, the equipment, they saw the lights, they saw the camera, and I was screaming the entire time. It's a movie. It's a movie. Don't, you know, don't shoot. It's a movie. And, um, and they quickly realized what was going on and they, they got us up and the, the main, you know, Lieutenant or whatever took us back inside and, and they were, you know, they were relieved, but in some ways I think they were also kind of embarrassed that they hadn't figured it out sooner that they, you know, didn't realize that it was fake and that they didn't see the camera and they didn't see the lights or whatever. So, uh, he started, you know, kind of giving us that you should, have, you know, you should have done this. You should have done that. Uh, you, you know, if you if you received a permit, then we would have known about it. And, and, and he was right. He was absolutely right about that. And I'll tell you something. It was one of the things in my life that made me, um, you know, it, it made me super risk averse. It made me realize how badly something can go. And we were just film students. You know, we didn't know any better, really, at the time. It was one of the first classes I ever had in school. And I was, you know, we were all young and. And we didn't think anything of it. You know, we didn't think that we should have called the police to tell them. We didn't think that we should have got that we should have, you know, done the permit process and any of those kinds of things. So, or or even have an off-duty, you know, officer there or security. Oh, you guys are just doing sort of a shotgun shoot. Yeah. Oh, literally. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was intense. And, and I was, you know, so at first I was, it was one of the most frightening things that ever happened to me in those 30 seconds, because I thought someone was going to get hurt because of me, you know, because I didn't yeah. do something or because I didn't, you know, so that was, that was rough. And then, you know, it was relief. And then the cops left almost instantly. They were just gone. And so we're all standing there in this Wits barbecue. And I said, listen, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened. And, uh, you know, if all of you hate me and never want to speak to me again, I'll totally understand. I mean, I, you know, it, this was my project and my class and, and I, you know, I should have, I should have been smart enough to, to do this, you know, better. And, and everybody was like, it's all right, man, it's fine. In fact, I, James or Tom or somebody said, are right, we're going to keep shooting? Right. <laughs> and I said, if you want to, yeah, that's amazing. If you want to, and everybody that was there, I'm still really, really good friends with. They're some of the best friends I've ever had. And, uh, and, oh, and that wow. kind of thing bonds you, you know, it certainly bonds you, uh, that kind of moment. And again, it taught me a really, really big lesson about not cutting corners. 
and yeah. about that that horrible things can happen on a film set and people can get hurt and uh, and you have to take responsibility. Uh, and, and that was, that was how I learned that. <laughs> it reminds me of the book, um, tribe by Sebastian Younger, where he talks about for men to bond for life, they just need to go through something harrowing together. Um, usually something that feels difficult, like maybe a trek up Everest or, or near death experience together where you helped each other out to survive. And you're just bonded for life because of it. And when you think about the police violence of today and, and sort of how poorly trained they are and, and what kind of decisions they make under duress, for example, you certainly are lucky to be alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it could absolutely. Have, uh, it, it, it could have, have gone, gone much sideways. differently. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it would have it, changed all of our lives instantly. And that if that doesn't, you know. That I mean, it taught, I think it taught all of us a lesson, but it certainly taught me a lesson because I was the one that brought us all together there that day. You know, we made, maybe all of us were getting, I mean, most of the people that were there were students at the school and we were all getting credit for it or whatever, but I was the one that came up with the concept of making fun of it. I was the one that got us all there. And yeah, it was, uh, and you have to think too, 20 years later, I love every single body that was in that building. You know, there's some of my best friends in the world. So the thought that any one of them could have been hurt because of the, you know, because I didn't do it correctly or I didn't, you know, take the precautions. It's, we joke about it now and it, and it's funny now, you know, but, uh, yeah, a split second and it could have changed everything. Yeah. So just, that's just incredible. That's the universe had different plans for you, Mr. Uh, yeah. You, yeah, and yeah, we, yeah. we need you to us, live yeah. and different plans <laughs> for everyone involved. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you're working on an animation film coming up. Um, trying when did to, you fall, yeah. Yeah. When did you fall in love with stop motion animation and puppetry? And, and, and is this in that, in that vein? Cause I know that's a big love of yours. Yeah. Um, always loved it. Probably. I think, you know, everything that Jim Henson did, you know, I mean, uh, for my generation, that was, you know, those were really big, uh, movies and shows and things that, you know, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, all those, you know, the Muppet Show, all that stuff, right? I mean, that was, mm -hmm. I just ate that stuff up when I was a kid and been fascinated by it. And then along the way, I've been lucky enough to make friends with people that that are puppeteers and animators and things like that. And, uh, and I've just always really liked it. I've never had the opportunities to work in it as much as I wanted to. Uh, and I'm trying to create some of those opportunities now. And, um, you know, a couple of the things that we're talking about right now are with, uh, you know, Tom Bancroft, who is a, you know, Disney animator, uh, animator director who uh, teaches over at Lipscomb. And uh, he and I have been talking about, you know, trying to do that because we have a lot of amazing animation talent in Nashville. You know, a lot of people just don't know that yet uh, or, or are now starting to realize that. But that's what I'm trying to do as I'm trying to put some people together that could uh, maybe make an independent animated film, which doesn't happen a lot. And there are reasons behind that. Um, Tom uh, has educated us on, on some of those things and um, some of the other filmmakers and animators and people that we've talked to. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been uh, trying to figure that figured out. You know, it's a, it's an interesting thing because it's, you know, it's new to me in a lot of ways I and mean, filmmaking isn't and producing isn't, but, that that kind of producing is and so i'm trying to learn as fast as i can and um because i i would like to do it i would like to tackle it and i've tried to do a lot of different things i haven't been someone that spent my time doing the same thing over and over and over and over again necessarily yeah. uh i think that's why i wanted to do the political thing i think it's why i liked working in advertising and ultimate the ultimate goal mean to tell stories more and do film and television but you know, that's, so I've, I've been lucky enough to, to get some opportunities like that and meet some really interesting people. And just to be clear for the audience, um, when Chris said Lipscomb, he's talking about Lipscomb university, which is a great university here in uh, Nashville, beautiful Nashville, Tennessee, and, mm -hmm. and has a wonderful film program. So if anyone's into that and wants to, uh, can't quite make it out to, and make it into NYU or USC or anywhere else, I mean, Lipscomb, uh, obviously. And, and I think you mentioned Belmont earlier, also another university in town with a great film program that actually just purchased Watkins college, which has been around doing film, uh, forever. Um, have you written the screenplay? Like, I, I guess, what is this film about? Do you know what it's going to be about? Can you, can you give us a little synopsis? 
Uh, not yet, but there's a couple of things. There's some different things floating around out there that uh, that we've been looking at. Yeah. So not exactly. I can't talk about it right now, but yeah, there's been a couple of things that we're looking at that we want to try to maybe do. And uh, part of that is trying to get the rights to, to certain existing IP and then in some cases maybe do something that's original, but um, yeah, we're still working on that, but that's kind of the next thing that I want to try to do. I mean, I'll still work on other projects as they come along, of course, but uh, that's what I'm really kind of most interested in right now is trying to, trying to get into that more. Love it. And, and, so Hideout Pictures is um, sort of a conglomerate, a group that you work at where you're a producer. You guys have movies um, like Beauty Mark, which was was excellent. And you've got Howard's Mill that looks fascinating. I, I can't wait to to dig into that. That looks like it has the chance to be a unicorn um, if the film plays out the, the way it sort of feels like it's going to play out. Love Jay and Silent Bob in terms of that reboot. Mm -hmm. I, I love their, their whole thing. So you guys have worked on some significant films. You've got uh, another one coming out, um, old Henry, mm -hmm. um, that looks incredible as well. Howard's, is there, is there anything you can, can discuss around Howard's meal without giving too much of the behind the curtain stuff away? Well, sure. I mean, the so I've had a, you know, now a pretty long relationship with uh, Hideout and Hideout is, you know, made up of the founder, Shannon Houchins and uh, Jason Ponceroli. Most people know him as Potsy and uh, yeah. I've worked with them for a long time. And back in uh, several years ago, you know, Billy Ray Cyrus came to them with the idea for Still the King and uh, Potsy and Travis wrote the, you know, with, with Billy wrote the original script and you know, they self-funded a pilot, which almost no one does, but they, they chose to do it. And it was a pretty bold move. And, uh, that pilot ultimately got sold to uh, CMT and we produced two seasons of that show and then 26 episodes, um, which was a really great experience. I mean, we had an amazing cast and crew for that, that show. And, and it was, uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was just a great experience. It was really, I mean, you know, like all things, there were ups and downs uh, during the production, but overall it really felt like sort of a, it was a nice sort of family feeling on set. I mean, like everybody got along fundamentally and, and, and we did a lot of good work. And I think we accomplished a lot with the, with what we had, the resources that we had, mm -hmm. but I've, I've done a lot of work with those guys. I'm not a partner there or, or an employee. I just, we just have always worked together a lot. And, uh, and I guess I've, you know, hopefully have been an asset to, you know, when they've asked me to be. And um, so I helped out with Howard's Mill uh, and then on Old Henry. Old Henry was actually produced by Mike Haggerty, uh, who came from California, has lived here for quite a while. He's a, mm -hmm. a, a good producer. And they they also had a good team, Tamara Brooks, and a lot of different people worked on that. They, again, they had a really good group of people. I was not on that job day to day. I helped in the development stage and in some of the scouting pre-production I did uh, help them with some of the tax incentive stuff but um I was there for it's and you know when Potsy wrote it and sort of came up with it and everything and it's a partnership between Hideout and Shout Factory oh, yes. um, okay and I think it's I think it's a, you know I think it's really it's really good I think it's one of the best things the company's made you know it stars Tim Blake Nelson and Stephen Dorff and yeah a lot of other really good actors and um and so yeah you know they hideouts got big ambitions and they want to, you know, they're going to continue to, to do well. It's, it's a subsidiary of average Joe's entertainment, which is a record label and right. marketing company and, you know, touring and, and other things. And, uh, and Shannon got his start. He and Colt working for Jermaine Dupree in Atlanta. Uh, oh, wow. so Shannon produced a lot of remix records for Usher and TLC and people like that. And then, they came up here and formed Average Joe's. Uh, Colt was their first, Colt Ford was their first artist. And uh, that's how they have a, a another partner named Zach McElroy. Uh, and they all grew up, you know, in the same general areas in uh, Georgia and knew each other and that kind of thing. That's how that started. But, uh, but yeah, that's what Hideout's doing. And they've got a lot of, you know, Trevor O'Neill works there now and has got some television projects that they've sold and they're going to be doing over the next couple of years. And, um, and yeah, there's, you know, con continuing to produce content and, um, I'm interested to see, you know, where it goes. I mean, they're, they're doing some good work. Absolutely. Steven Dorf is sneaky. Great. And <laughs> so I'll say that, but you mentioned something in the middle that fascinated me that I think was just sort of an, uh, 
a side comment, but really sticks out in terms of what we try to get across to this audience, especially in our indie talks. And we've been on consults with, um, with TV writers and we have said, Hey, uh, get your package together and, and don't, don't shoot a pilot unless someone's going to fund the pilot that's on the buy side. Um, you're saying Billy Ray, and then they funded their own pilot and you said it, it almost never happens. And I would agree with that. Uh, why do you think it worked for them to do it that way? And, and, and it feels like Billy Ray had a name. Like it feels like he could have just walked to CMT and said, I'm Billy Ray Cyrus. Here's who I have in the show. Here's what it's about. Will you fund a pilot and see if you like it? Why, why did they go the other way? First of all, I think your advice to people is correct. You know, I mean, I think it's uh, it's a really big risk to do it the way that these guys did it. But I think Shannon and Billy, you know, I think they wanted to make the show the way they wanted it to, to you know, creatively, they wanted to make the show the way they wanted it to be. And I think they felt like they had the resources to, you know, figure it out and, and get it done. And that way they would, you know, it would, it, would, it really wouldn't be a pitch as much as it would be, this is the show we want to make. It's right here. All you have to, you know, you're looking at it. And if you would like to, you know, order it, we would love to make it for you. Um, because I think a lot of people probably would have tried to have driven the creative team, you know, Patsy and Billy and Shannon and Travis in a different direction. Um, and in fact, there was a, another showrunner that, do, that normally does three camera shows that wanted to take it in a much different direction. Hmm. Um, and I think they said, you know what, we're just going to shoot our own pilot and do it our way. And, and the, you know, look, the company is sort of, you know, comes from that. It comes from doing it themselves, starting their own thing, um, taking risks. And the, and truth is, you know, most of their risks have paid off. You know, they've got a good track record when it comes to that. And it's the same reason they made Howard Howard's mill on their own. You know, hmm. they had this idea they had their own concept and they wanted to see it happen. And so they, you know, that's what they did. They called, you know, people, cast, crew uh, that they had worked with before. And they said, look, this is what we're going to try. We don't know if it'll work. Let's do it. You know, and 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 so they've, they've had success doing that. You know, they've had success doing that. Um, not only in film and television, but in the music business as well. So I think, it, yeah, it was a it was a perfect storm to answer your original question. I think Billy coming there. Uh, and where the guys were in their careers and where the company was. And it was just all kind of the perfect storm. And it, and it coincided with Jason Dinsmore and, and the other executives at CMT wanting to do scripted programming, which the network had not done at that point. Yeah. You know, they, they were famous for, you know, uh, award shows, you know, live specials, music videos, things like that. Uh, unscripted material and and they did a big push you know sun records was a great show that they did yeah. during mm -hmm. that time and they were talking about some other shows as well in fact one of the uh, writers on still the king uh, got a pilot made for another series that was going to come but that just i mean honestly in still the king the executives had told us they wanted a, a third season but um Bob Backish took over at Viacom and they decided to shift some things around and uh, they decided to, that they were going to launch Paramount, uh, you know, the Paramount plus network. And so they shifted those resources towards that. And some of the shows that I think would have been on CMT, I think ultimately maybe ended up at Paramount. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think that was the case. And, uh, and ultimately they decided not to do scripted anymore. And so sun records and still the King and a couple other things that they had, uh, that they were working on that ended up not, you know, continuing, but, uh, yeah. But that's kind of how that went down is it was just really the perfect storm. But I would give, even though I worked on a show that <laughs> ended up being in existence because someone made their own pilot. Yes, I would. My advice to people would be, you know, get your pitch ready and and absolutely do not make your own pilot. You know, a proof of concept, a scene, something like that. That's one thing. Or if you find, you know, the talent that you want to attach to it and they're willing to, you know, do like, you know, do sort of a promo piece uh, to help sell it. That's one thing, but a full on pilot with the entire cast and everything, that's, it was a bold move. Again, it worked, but uh, you know, would we, and I think Shannon and Potsy and everybody involved, Travis would tell you the same thing now. Like, you know, I, I don't know that they would necessarily make that choice again, but I'm glad they did. Cause again, we got to you know, <laughs> make two seasons of a, of a show that was a lot of fun to make, but 
Exactly. And I think if uh, Paramount Plus actually runs it, it could find a new audience and then they could be knocking on the door again for season three, four or five. And that's just kind of the way the Internet works today. Um, you mentioned pitching. Yeah. And I think you're um, a great person to, to give us some uh, advice on that, if you will. Maybe advice is the wrong word, but maybe some technical on that, some tactics on it. Because as a producer, uh, I know you're producing things and you're hearing pitches, but I think you're also being pitched too. Because once you decide to produce something, you're kind of married to a project for the foreseeable future. So if you had one month to teach someone how to pitch, to, to win, to sell, what would be the first three things you would teach them? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, well, you just said something that's pretty key. You know, this is going to be something that you're going to have to work hard at and live with for a long time. You know, if it's successful, if you're successful and they, and they, someone picks up your show or whatever, you know, it's going to, you need to make sure it's something that you're willing to work hard at and fight for. It's a lot of work. You know, doing a series is a lot of work. Uh, not that anything in our business isn't, but I mean, it, you know, series is a, it's a grind, you know, uh, 14, 18 weeks of writing, going into production, you know, it's a, it's a lot. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta really be in love with it and you gotta, you know, I would also say you have to work on getting, you know, being good at the pitch. I mean, there's certain, there's a certain part of pitching something to someone that's a performance in a way. Mm. And I think you have to really love it. And yet that has to come across. Also, you're also pitching it to companies that have enough money that they can hire just about anybody that they want. And so right. how are you going to make it stand out? You know, I mean, if you think about it, if you're a director or a writer or whoever you are, you know, those those big studios and those big networks can fundamentally, they have the resources to fundamentally hire everyone that's out there within reason, but they can hire people that you idolize. So you're basically, you know, you could go into a meeting and someone that you grew up loving their work could have just been there. Mm. And, and we've had that happen. You know, we've had that happen where we've, where we've gone in, you know, uh, to pitch something and, and they'll say, Oh, so-and-so was just here. And you're like, okay, wow. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and that's what you're up against. You know, you're, you're up against, it's not just who's in your market or who's in your peer group. It's you're up against everyone because they can pick up anything Fun, again, you know, within reason, they can pick up just about anything. So just make sure that it's attractive and it has those kinds of qualities and is, and, and also sort of be realistic about it. Like, you know, are you watching the market enough to know what they seem to be trying to buy? And, you know, do you have re relationships with agents and people that, that know what, know that, that they have those conversations with executives, they know what they're looking for, you know, and it changes so quickly, you know, so every few months, are you actually getting to hear what those people are wanting? And now let me also say, I'm someone that I, I also believe in, if you have a great concept and you have a great, you know, pitch, even if it's not what they're looking for, whatever, go in there and try to sell it, you know, because you, you may be lucky to, to sell it to that one executive that understands you and chances are, and, and we've all heard these stories are cliches now, but you know, you're probably going to, you, you may walk in and you may sell it to the first person that you meet, but mm -hmm. more than likely you're going to sell it to the 50th person that you've met. And you have to be also willing to love it enough to, to not let it die. And just to keep like, this is a good idea. We're going to keep trying to sell this, keep trying to sell this. Um, and I've, I've worked on projects like that. You know, uh, I, I do the cleverlies with, uh, my friend, Paul Harris and Matthew Dyer. And, and we've done that. We've pitched that show, you know, to a lot of people and we've had a couple of offers and a couple of deals sitting on the table. And you also have to know if you're, you know, you have to be ready to accept those deals. Like we've been offered some deals that we didn't want to take. And it was a weird moment. You work so hard to get to an offer and then you get an offer and it's not what you want because in that particular case, it's a, it's a, a comedy. Um, and you know, we were, we sort of got these cliche things like, okay, we'll take it from here. Like, thanks for bringing this great idea. And now we're going to give you EP credits and we're going to tell you how your show is going to go. And it's like, uh, that's not why we're doing this. We're doing this because we want to work together and we don't want to, you know, uh, we don't want it to turn into something that it's not, which, which is what happened with still the King, you know, right. uh, so they wanted to turn it into a three camera sitcom. And, and the guys were like, that is not what we want to make. That's not why we started this ball rolling. We didn't, we don't want to do that. And, 
and that's the way it's been with the Cleverleaf project. It was, you know, uh, which is Paul's band. Uh, it's sort of like a spinal for people that don't know, it's like a spinal tap thing, um, kind of concept. And, mm-hmm. and so we've had these really interesting pitch meetings and great opportunities, but in the end it was just never right. So we never did it. Cause we also knew that we'd be married to it, you know? So if we start this ball rolling and it's not what we want it to be, it's not, it's probably not going to get better. You know, we're just going to have to live with it, not being the thing that we always wanted it to be. And, and with some pitches, you know, they're not as close to you. That that particular project is close to the three of us, and it's Paul's. You know, Paul performs as you know as that character and, and that band all the time. You know, right. all, all year long. So it's it's we were sort of walking in there with, you know, um, it's like walking in with a child and someone saying like, hey, you know what? We'll take it from here. Thanks for being parents. And it's like, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> you, know, you don't get to just like grab our kid's hand and walk off with it. That's not how this is going to go, you know? Yeah. Um, but our industry is also set up that way, you know, to a certain extent, because those companies and it's, listen, it's their prerogative, you know, they want to put their thumb on it. They want to, you know, put their creative take on it and maybe they don't see eye to eye, you know, hundred percent. So we've had some interesting things, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I don't know what other advice I would give, except know the market, know who you're pitching to know the kinds of things they've, done had success with had failure you know the failures that they've had just so that you don't walk in there and you know pitch them something that they tried two years ago and it didn't work or whatever um and also making connections with people that again you know know the executives and agents typically agents and and other executives that can kind of say to you this is what we're looking for you know so what do you have that's in this vein uh, or, you know, again, if you have something that you think is special and stands out and is totally different, you know, then you, then it may be trying to figure out who is this right for, you know, cause mm-hmm. pitching to the wrong network. I, I see that a lot. I see people bring ideas to people that they just don't have any business. You know, you're not going to bring a comedy to something that someone that normally makes period pieces or whatever. So, right. you know, that that's part of it too, is just knowing the landscape enough to know, uh, who to call and who not to call. You don't bring a comedy to Blumhouse and it's, that's right. Yeah. It's such timely advice and, and see almost seemingly like uh overly logical advice. Like it doesn't see <laughs> it, it. It's, it's a thing you say to somebody and it almost sounds like a cliche. And yet, and yet Chris, what you find over and over and over again is the spray and pray technique. And I think the better technique is to be concise and sort of to measure twice and cut once and you'll have a much, much better success. Um, sort of in that same vein, uh, what are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see newcomers making? Hmm. Well, yeah, I tell you, business wise, for people that are getting into the the industry, I I always try to when I when I try to talk to students or young people or whoever's getting into it, I just tell them that what I wish I had done. So what I wish I had done, I wish I, you know, had. Uh, well, I don't know. Sorry, I'm trying to think of a better way to say this. I'll take your time. You got to prepare yourself. You know, it's, it's a, if you're, if you're going to have a, if you're going to do this for a living and you want your whole career to be in this, you have to prepare yourself because you may not be naturally geared to do some of it. You may be someone that doesn't handle rejection well. And if you don't handle rejection, well, this business is going to be very difficult. You may be someone that doesn't, you know, like the intense personalities that we talked about before that doesn't, you know, that doesn't adjust well to, to when that happens. And so what I always try to tell them is get yourself mentally prepared and, and, and as early as you can ask yourself why you're doing this. Like, why, why did you get into this? Do you want to be, what do you want to do? Do you want to tell stories? Do you have a point of view that you don't think is being expressed out there? Do you want to be, do you, do you think it's a, an avenue to become well-known or wealthy or what is it? Why are you doing it? Cause if you're going to spend your whole life doing it, you know, knowing why you're doing it, self-examining enough to realize this is why I got into this. This is why it's important to me can, can really help. I mean, it can really, really help to, to be able to self-examine enough to say, you know, this is why I got into this. And so these are the parts of it that work for me. And these are the parts of it that don't work for me. 
and I need to try to go towards the things that work and avoid the things that don't. Um, and also to just get, you know, prepared other ways, like, you know, financially, it is difficult to work in our business because typically you're going to be a, you know, contract labor of some kind. You go from job to job to job and you live on your reputation and your real or whatever it is. And, you know, I, I saw that early on. I saw people, you know, you start working on a movie and then you start seeing the new cars hit the parking lot immediately. You start seeing, you know, big vacations being planned and all <laughs> these things. And then, you know, a couple of months later, someone ends up being broke because they thought that that was going to last forever. You know, they yeah. get on a show and they, you know, they do all these things and then they, you know, realize like, oh no, you know, now what am I going to do? Cause I'm not going to, if, so that's what I say to them is prepare, you know, prepare to have lean times. And uh, if you do that and you can be successful at that, then again, it'll, it'll make all this less maddening for sure. Uh, cause I, you know, I had moments of that at the beginning where I learned my lessons really quickly. And it was actually one of the things that made me want to, um, you know, get rid of credit cards and get out of debt when I was young was working on movies and realizing like, you know what, if I'll just stockpile this money and, you know, focus on work and not think about all the, you know, the new car that I could get or all these other things, then I'll be better off and I can even wait. And that's what I did. I mean, I, I spent the first 15, 20 years of this taking every job that got offered to me, hoping that I could spend the last 20 years being picky and maybe mm -hmm. not taking every job that got offered. And, and when you get to the point where you can start to say no, that's a huge day. It was a, it was for me, you know, when I got to, when I could look, when I could look at a job and realize that is going to be a nightmare. Like I want no part of that. <laughs> and when I could say, and when I, and, and, and so I was financially secure enough to say, I saved my money and I don't have to take that job that, that I know is going to be a nightmare and that I know that I'm going to be miserable doing, you know, I'm going to be standing in the rain and at night for the next week and I'm going to hate it. I'm going to hate myself. You know, so that was a big moment for me. I worked, tried to work really hard, save my money and, and be, be smart about those things so that I could start to say no. And again, I had good mentors and people also tell me that like, look, if you'll, you know, if you'll plan and you'll think about this and, and be honest with yourself and honest with, you know, your finances and things like that, you'll be a lot happier, a lot faster. And, and, and I was lucky enough for that to be true. Um, but it also took sacrifice. It meant not going on vacations because a lot of people want to do that. You know, you want to, uh, uh, you know, movies, TV shows are hard. You work all those days. You don't, you know, you don't have time to do almost anything else. You want to take a big vacation when it's over. You want to buy a new car. You want to you know, do whatever you're going to do. And it takes a lot of discipline to not do that sometimes and to save that money so that for the next six months, you don't have to worry about work as much as you, you know, you did the six months before, but, um, but yeah. I love that. I love that. And Chris, I've loved this conversation. You've been so generous with your time and, and your wisdom. Is, is it wisdom? I don't, I, don't <laughs> I think, I think it is. And, okay. and, and um, That's good that, that last piece is a, it's a great place to stop and let our audience sort of reflect on what you just said, because again, it comes off as overly logical, but yet we see it happen over and over and over again, because what's in a person's heart is really hard to overcome. And if what's in your heart is a lot of hubris and uh, a lot of glamour and vanity and, and what you want to show to call back to the beginning of this conversation stuff on Instagram, then you, you know, you could be in trouble. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, thank you for that. that. That is so spot on. And why don't you tell everybody where they can get more of Chris Connor. <laughs> they want more. Where, where can we find you on the, the internet? Uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem, but um, yeah, no, on social um, media and maybe we even see some of your work. Yeah. Uh, on social media, the only social media I have is Instagram and it's my name, you know, Chris underscore Connor. Um, and work wise, you know, it's spread out there on streaming services and all over the place, I guess, in some ways. So, uh, I don't really know where to direct you exactly, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, I am not good at self-promotion, uh, and that's by choice, but, um, and that isn't, that's not a, necessarily a good or a bad thing. It just is what it is. Uh, so <laughs> that's probably the best way to, to find me is, uh, uh, you know, the, the Instagram is really the only outlet I have like that, but truth is I don't often talk about work on there very much. Um, but yeah. 
My suggestion to the audience is to go find your favorite music video uh, or film and then find out Chris Connor is working on it. Uh, any, you know, anything oh, that uh, Hideout Pictures has done uh, of late, maybe in the last year or two, three, uh, anything Ed Pryor's worked on, uh, you'll see your name attached to it. And, and Chris, you're the perfect man behind the scenes. And uh, we'll end on this. How did you make it 20 plus years in this industry without drinking alcohol? Well, let me, let me, it's okay. <laughs> um, it feels like it's a prerequisite. Man, seriously, like you, did you like talk to everyone I know? Like, how did you, um, I used to, well, let me first of all say, uh, I actually love alcohol. Uh, I used oh. to drink and enjoy it quite a bit. Um, and what actually happened was, and my mom has the same thing. I developed what basically is allergic reaction to it. Mm. Um, when I was in my early thirties, uh, I started to have, uh, it wasn't really like full anaphylaxis or that kind of reaction, but it was down that, down that road for sure, where it made me ill, you know? Uh, and I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. So I had to give it up because it, it made me feel rotten and it, and it came on pretty quickly. It was really, over, and I was a casual drinker. I, did, I actually never drank that much, but, uh, but yeah, I had to give it up because I just couldn't do it. It just made me feel bad. And I could see that the reaction was getting worse and worse. Uh, I, you know, I get flush in the face and my throat would get itchy and all the sort of signs of like, you know, your body does not want you to do this anymore. Um, what did you replace so, it with? You know, um, I didn't really have one. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of vices and, uh, I didn't, I don't think that I get there. What there really wasn't an adequate replacement, uh, but I, you know, it's one of those things where I, I miss it sometimes, you know, every now and again, I wish it'd be nice to have a glass of wine or whatever, but I don't, or uh, some vodka, but I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't really miss it that much. But, and I find myself in situations where, you know, um, people are having a good time and it's there, but I just don't really miss it. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I like it though. I wish I could have it. But Chris, I, I think technology is going to bail you out. I think there's all these companies right <laughs> Man, now that, so. uh, much like uh, Beyond Beef and Impossible, there are all these spirit companies that are making vodkas and bourbons and beers that taste just like the real thing and have zero alcohol in them. So, uh, with that, I think that uh, uh, me and you. Should get together. I'll bring a bottle of non-alcoholic vodka, sure. something flavored. We'll, right, right, we'll mix right. it up. We'll have a conversation. And o- and O'Doul's. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, no, no, O'Doul's is back in, you know, that's Beavis and Butthead times. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've moved forward now. This this is high-end stuff, Chris. Like, we're, we're going to go Organic. all the way. Okay. And uh, just just have a, a wonderful time together because I, w- I would love to, to talk to you in person, meet you, and, and hang out a little bit. And um, like I said... This has been such an honor for me and, and I've had such a great time yeah, and learned man. so much. Yeah. Um, as I always say, I, I, I would wish you luck, but I don't think you need it. And uh, um, we all need luck, man. You, <laughs> we all need luck. Let me tell you. Um, one thing I want to say to real quick before we, before we go is you yes. said this at the beginning. And if this is true, I, I hope it certainly is. But, you know, if I have helped anybody and been any kind of mentor to anybody or helped them get their career started, which I, I don't know that you know, I've, I've always wanted that to be the case. So if that, if you heard that feedback, that's really exciting to me. And I've, and tr- to be honest with you, that feels like success to me because, uh, I've always hoped that, you know, I would create a lot more, you know, a lot more filmmakers and, and encourage people to do this stuff. Uh, so I'm, I would, that was exciting. I, I appreciate you. Thanks, you know, for saying that. And if your research led you to that, that's great. Cause, uh, I've always wanted that to be the case. And it's not something that you really know, cause you know, you don't talk to people about it, but if you've had that feedback, that, that makes me happy to know that. Well, thank you, man. That, that means the world. And, uh, it certainly is the case and reminds me of the old Sean Lennon quote, life is mostly what you don't see. And, uh, I'm glad I could be an extra set of eyes for you so that you can see it. the impact you're having on the indie film community and the film community uh, at large. I would love to to continue the conversation in a round two, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to hopefully hold you to it if you're up to it, and, and hopefully bet, yeah. we can do it live as well. So, Chris, thank you so much, man. This has been yeah, great. Thank you. It's been a good time. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Be good. Bye. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. 
To find out more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You now have the opportunity to support the production of this podcast. If you love Make It and are a true fan of what we're trying to accomplish in the indie film community, please visit www.bonsai.film and click Contribute. Contributions start at only $5 monthly. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and on Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. You can provide feedback to us via email at contact at bonsai.film and you can follow me, Chris, on Twitter at Flaming Your Heart. That's F-L-A-M-E-I-N-U-R-H-E-A-R-T. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on services to explore a variety of offerings from keynotes and panels to pitch readiness assessments and so much more. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.